Are you looking for the perfect holiday gift? Look no further than an AHA membership gift card, which packs 365 days of beery benefits, including a subscription to Zymergy magazine. What's more, your purchase of an AHA membership gift card comes with your choice of a free gift. Modern homebrew recipes by Gordon Strong, craft beer deconstructed poster, or AHA branded socks. Learn more at homebrewersassociation.org and give the gift of beer. Order by December 13th for holiday delivery. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 19th, 2015. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby of BeerAndWineJournal.com joins us to talk about holiday spices to use in our seasonal beers. Also, a quick and easy cranberry beer to sparkle up your end-of-the-year gatherings. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And check out the new lower pricing on our DVDs just in time for your holiday shopping. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on the Google Plus, too. Thanks again to everybody clicking on our Amazon.com associate link and our basicbrewing.com site, especially during the busy holiday season that's coming up. Whenever you think of going to Amazon for shopping, go to us first and click on our associate link on basicbrewing.com. It's on the right-hand side of the page there. It'll take you to Amazon where you can shop at your heart uh, to your heart's content. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who's done so already. Don't forget our brewer's logbook, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of brew. And there is a blank calendar in the front to give you a full 12 months of fermentation tracking, no matter when you buy it. Very exciting news just in. Chris Colby, Andy Sparks, and I are all set to attend the first ever New Zealand Homebrewers Conference on March 18th through 20th in Nelson, New Zealand. Many thanks to organizers Carl Summerfield, Mike Stringer, and Ed Bream for working to get us down there. Last time I checked, most of the conference is already sold out, but you can go to nzhc.nz to see if there is still space before November 30th. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Nelson is where the uh, hops come from. And we'll be down there for harvest time. So I'm looking forward to participating in the conference. I think they've got us set up to brew some beer. And uh, we'll be getting lots of good content for the show. And uh, by the way, this week's interview with Chris was recorded before we got final confirmation. So uh, we didn't talk about it. But I assure you that Chris is very excited as well. And Andy is too. How cool is that? So for those of you who signed up for the conference, March 18th through 20th, we will see you in New Zealand. Let's explore the mailbag, shall we? Uh, sometimes letters either get lost in the mailbag or people are catching up on episodes and uh, send in comments on episodes from a few weeks back. And this one comes from our good friend Sean Terrell about the episode uh, a few weeks ago on designing craft uh, or draft uh, beer systems. Sean says, a few years ago, I was setting up a high-pressure draft line and getting really frustrated, so I calculated the theoretical resistance for vinyl tubing and found that it's about a quarter to a half the values that are generally given for three-sixteenths of an inch tubing, which made sense once I thought about it, Sean says. The smallest restrictions are at the keg post and the faucet. Treating those as zero-resistant parts is going to in, uh, introduce a lot of error. I've used my presumably more accurate numbers to set up a number of systems since then with good results. And uh, you can go to seanterrell.com and uh, search for that. Uh, and uh, and Sean has written an article about uh, setting up draft systems with uh, the proper resistances. 
Uh, on a semi-related note, Sean says, I'd take a jockey box camping, including to Burning Man, where kegs reach greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit for a week and a half, and I don't have any problems pouring delicious, frosty beverages as long as the cold plate stays iced. I do use an extra-long line to compensate for the high serving pressure at those temperatures. Hopefully this is uh, helpful for the listener who was curious. So there you go. Uh, you don't have to refrigerate the keg uh, when using a jockey box, even in extreme temps, if you work it right. So thanks, Sean. It's always good to hear from Sean Terrell. Go to seanterrell.com and uh, check him out. Uh, I've been corresponding with listener Seth on the topic of getting different results from uh, competitions uh, with the same beer, entering the same beer in different competitions and getting different numbers back. Seth says, I just got back from a nerve-wracking competition. My barrel-aged stout won first place again. Well, that doesn't seem nerve-wracking. Uh, in the first competition with about 90 total entries, it scored 425 and was then chosen to brew in their professional system to serve on tap. Well, congratulations. Seth says in the second competition, with about 200 total entries, it scored 29.6. And tonight it won first in category at 38.5, with 330 entries in the whole competition. Never know what you're going to end up with. <laughs> so he went from, on the same beer, he went from 42.5 to 29.6, and then back up to 38.5. So, uh, well, congratulations, Seth, and condolences, I guess, it. Uh, just proves again that beer judges uh, have are, are, are people, and they have different opinions and different palates. So I guess the lesson from that is if you score low in one competition and you think the beer is good, you you may want to try it again. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if a big, flavorful beer like a barrel-aged stout uh, is more likely to have a larger variation in scores than a more subtle style. Uh, then there is this from Jeff. In Rocky, Australia, I was having a chat to a bloke the other day about home brewing. Uh, he's been at it since the early 1980s. Not the first one I've had a similar chat to. It wasn't over a home brew, but over the side of a ute. I had to look that up. A ute is apparently a, I think it's one of those uh, uh, hybrid uh, trucks and cars, kind of like um, the El Camino back here in the in the United States. Anyway, uh Jeff says, we got talking about sanitizing. We both agreed that there is way too much emphasis put on it. Go back to earlier homebrew years when they used to ferment the wort in a vessel such as a new rubbish bin and just lay a towel over the top. I am a bit careful, but don't go over the top and have never detected an issue. I believe it is a bit like the Listerine method, Jeff says. Others have followed but they were the first to do it to my knowledge. They created a situation where people were scared not to use their product. You may have halitosis and not even know it. Use our product to be sure. Uh, you don't want to end up unmarried or with no friends. Uh, Seth says, or Jeff, I'm sorry, says, homebrew supply shop saying, you have to sanitize everything with a product we can sell you or you will get nasty infection in your beer. Make sure you boil all water for at least 10 minutes. Humbug! Unless your water comes out of a rainwater tank or a ground tank where animals have been pooping in it, it's <laughs> it's already sanitized to a sufficient degree. Uh, Jeff says commercial brewing is a different situation, so it does not come into the argument. Well, you know, like anything, I guess stressing out less about sanitizing works until it doesn't. Um and, you know, the good thing about home brewing is that you can follow your own instincts. If you don't want to stress out as much about sanitizing, you don't have to stress out about sanitizing. If you find a cleaning and sanitizing routine that produces good beer consistently, then stick with it. Uh, but I ha I've i tasted enough uh, contaminated home brew uh, and have read enough troubleshooting uh, question uh, questions from listeners on through email to to know that you can you can get contaminated homebrew it's a real thing uh so uh to avoid that i usually follow the belt and suspenders approach of being extra cautious so that's just my approach now saying that uh i have an experiment in the works that may test my assumptions i made something with filtered tap water that wasn't boiled so uh, i've got my fingers crossed and i'll let you know how that uh, turns out 
it how it turns out it, it it may be a disaster how it turns out and speaking of disasters Steve and I will be getting together in the next couple of weeks to record our annual brewing disaster show so get your story in to me at james at basicbrewing.com uh here in the next week or so uh and we have already received some really good ones I know that there are some that don't like to talk about Christmas before Thanksgiving, but it's an evolving world. You know, time flies. And sometimes if you want something extra nice under the tree, you have to talk to Santa a little longer to get do some extra convincing that you've been good good enough, you know. Well, the electric brewing systems from our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa, are worth that extra convincing. Uh, take the electric brew in a bag system that I have. Uh, you can see it in action at youtube.com slash highgravitybrew. I have the 240-volt version with the pump, but High Gravity also has a 120-volt 5-gallon system with the pump and a 120-volt 5-gallon system with no pump if you want to uh, stick to the uh, traditions of brewing a bag. And uh, as you know, I love mine, uh, and I'm really enjoying not having to worry about propane or propane accessories. So ch check out those Excellent uh, electro, uh, electric brewing systems, uh, and for ingredients and many other products, High Gravity offers seven dollar and ninety nine cent flat rate shipping. So check all of that out. Send Santa the link to highgravitybrew.com. Well, it is that time of year, time to brew up last minute special brews for Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, and all those fun uh, festivus, all those fun holidays with family and friends. And uh, a lot of those brews incorporate some familiar and tasty spices, about which we talked to Chris Colby. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Got some exciting news to tell us. What, what's been going on? Uh, yeah, next year at about this time, actually a little earlier, I will have a book out. Woohoo! Yeah, woohoo! And this is yeah. like a real live book. This isn't like Chris Colby Publishing. This is uh, uh, this is a, a book publishing company that has, I understand, approached you after seeing your fine, fine work on beerandwinejournal.com. Yeah, it's a, a a book publisher, and they do they do primary primarily uh, food recipe books, but they've had the idea of wanting to do a beer recipe book for a while. So, um. I'm going to do a book of beer recipes that, that cover uh, most of the major styles. And along with each recipe, there'll be like an in-depth look at either uh, one of the techniques associated with that beer. You know, for example, uh, the Boat Pills recipe is going to have a discussion of, of a triple decoction mash. Uh, you know, uh, one of the IPA recipes will have a discussion of dry hopping, that sort of thing stuff so um you know it'll be not only a compendium of, of recipes but it will uh you know describe a, a large variety of brewing techniques in uh in detail you know how how exactly they're used within the recipe and then but then there'll also be a little bit of a discussion of them along with it very exciting and this this company page publishing uh they have uh that's right page publishing page street page street publishing you yep. got it half right <laughs> the, they do some really beautiful work, uh, so there should be some. Uh, some it should be good to you know fun to look at as well as fun to read as well. So, uh, very exciting news and congratulations and uh, and you, you might see a recipe from uh, some other familiar uh, names in there as well. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> <laughs> that just might happen. <laughs> Very exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, let, let's talk about this is the time of year. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving is next week, so it's a little late to be brewing up a beer for Thanksgiving. Uh, but if you do a session ale, uh, you could do a beer in time for certainly New Year's uh, and probably uh, Christmas. And so, you know, when we talk about uh, holiday beers, uh, you know, people – People, some people think that you know pumpkin pie spice is overused uh, nowadays, or people, you know, they roll their eyes when the, when breweries roll out the pumpkin beers. But done well, uh, spiced holiday beers can be delightful and delicious, uh, and 
you know, a great addition to the holiday table. Uh, so you're going to take us through some, some of the most common, uh, commonly used spices and uh, talk about them and talk about how to use them and some strategies of how you can uh, some brew up some, some delicious holiday beers. So what, what are the spices that we're talking about? Yeah, there's um, if you look at holiday beers like, you know, Anchor has has the very famous series of, uh, you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year beers that they put out. Yeah. And, you know, they've they've run the run the gamut in uh, uh, different spices and, and, you know, so breweries everywhere. Um, I tried to pick four that are common, uh, commonly used in winter warmers and also four that uh that actually work well together. They're often found in spice blends. And uh, so the the four I chose to highlight are cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, and allspice. So cinnamon, that's an easy one. Or is it? Uh, we think we know what cinnamon is, but sometimes uh, we may not. <laughs> After I, I did some research one time and I thought it, it's it's the bark of the cinnamon tree, right? Uh, well, is that is that correct or is that a misconception? Yeah, it's um, it's the bark of the cinnamon tree, but there are multiple kinds of cinnamon trees. Um, there's what's called true cinnamon, or some people label as uh, true cinnamon, which comes from the plant Cinnamomum verum, which is grown in uh, Sri Lanka and Ceylon. Um, and then there's there's other uh, cinnamons that the, some people just call cassia instead, and that comes from uh, the Cinnamomum. Uh, cassia plant uh that if, if i remember right is largely grown in china and uh anyway most most commercial cinnamon that you buy is uh is that the cassia type um you'd have to sort of if you were just at a grocery store that's what you'd probably find if you went to an actual spice store they might be able to have the actual uh uh you know sea verum cinnamon uh so yeah, there, there's more than one kind, and then there's also there are there are other uh, trees in that same genus that also in different parts of the world that produce. So there's a lot of different things labeled as cinnamon, and they're all you know they all share some 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 commonalities. You know, uh, you know everyone knows the taste of cinnamon from you know cinnamon rolls, cinnamon toast, that kind kind of thing. And um, yeah, they all they all share a. a a similar similarity, but there there are different kinds of cinnamon. So, would I wonder if uh, if the I don't know that I've had different kinds. I, I, who knows what I've had, you know, because it's just been from the uh, ordinary spice rack, probably at the grocery store. I, I wonder if there are cinnamon experts that could tell you the difference between uh, the different varieties. <laughs> at a minimum, I'm sure there's experts that could tell you that they could tell you the difference. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I haven't sampled all these you know, side by side to know. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I would, you know, next time I'm at, I'm at somewhere that actually has a, a a decent spice, you know, rack, I'll probably try to look and see, you know, what, what the different kinds are. are. So, so put on your lab hat or your lab coat. Uh, and uh, what's the, what's the thing inside cinnamon that gives it that cinnamon flavor? Yeah. Okay. All, um, all or almost all, I don't know, I, I think all spices have what are called essential oils in them. That's just the the catch-all term for the, you know, the aromatic, flavorful part, part of them. And in cinnamon, 90% of the, the essential oil is cinnamaldehyde. Um, it's a, a fairly big molecule. It's got a ring and then a, a, a carbon, uh, like, branch sticking off of it. And so 90% of it is that molecule, which gives it its uh, characteristic flavor. Interestingly enough, it also has, uh, of the minor components of it, one of them, and there's a whole long list of them, uh, is linalool, which is, uh, if, you, if you remember your hop chemistry, that's one of the minor uh, uh, oils found in some hops. And... Also interesting, as as we'll see when we get to some of these other spices, it also has eugenol in it, which is uh, well to skip ahead. It, it that's a, a component of both cloves and allspice. Hmm. So mixture of things, but mostly uh, mostly the the cinnamaldehyde, which is you know that you know I think most people have a very distinct uh, idea of what 
you know, cinnamon tastes like, and it's mostly that. And cinnamon can you can get the cinnamon sticks. Or you can get ground cinnamon as well. Do you have an opinion on uh, which would be better in brewing? Uh, I mean, I think in almost every, any case, when you're dealing with spices, using the less processed form is going to, if you get it, you know, if you get it fresh and not already ground up, it's going to retain more of the essential oils. Like once you once you grind any spice up, uh, you know, it's. Uh, you know that they they sell ground spices for convenience, so you just you know, uh, uh, you know, shake it out. But that that that's also it. You know, exposes like every last bit of it to oxygen, and uh, you know, it lets all the, uh, you know, all the aromatic compounds are gonna uh, not dissolve, but you know, go go into the air. That's <laughs> yeah. I was a chemistry major. <laughs> <laughs> they, they go into air. <laughs> Now, the, I assume with, with all of these spices, evaporate. you could... There's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, what was that? Evaporate. Eva- <laughs> I was expecting a or, bigger word that I wouldn't know. Or volatilize, I guess. Well, there you go. That, that sounds more technical. Yeah. Uh, I would assume that with all these spices, uh, you could have a blanket statement saying the fresher, the better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and that, when we get to using them, that... That becomes uh, a very important fact because if you, you know, for example, if you if you bring a beer and it calls for allspice and you go to an actual spice store and get whole allspice and grind it yourself, uh, you know, a half teaspoon of that in five gallons of beer is going to be very different from a half teaspoon of a, you know, if you root around in your cupboard and find like, oh, here's a two year old, you know, thing of ground allspice, mm. you know. Those are those are going to be very different contributions to your beer. That's a good point. So cinnamon is spice number one. What is spice number two? Uh, spice number two is nutmeg. Okay, nutmeg. Uh, you know, I think most people know what that is. It's a uh, probably best known in the United States as one of the major components of pumpkin pie spice. Uh, this is a seed. Uh, and then the same seed actually produces the, the spice mace, which is which is similar. Uh, and this is from a plant called Myristica fragrance, uh, and, and it's grown in Indonesia. And in nutmeg, the major uh, component of the, the essential oil is D camphene. So different, you know, different molecule, and that gives it its different characteristic uh, uh, aroma and, and flavor. Uh, if you look through the uh, the list of, of minor components of it, though, in the essential oils, there's um, there's uh, limacine, which is a similar to limonene, which people might know. Uh, there's geraniol, which is a which is an essential oil that, that shows up in some hops. There's saffron, which is uh, part of the is a major part of the essential oils of saffron, and there's also one called myristicin, which uh, also shows up in its in larger amounts in the leaves of both parsley and dill. Hmm. So it's got nutmeg's got like all all these uh, all these spices have um, a long list uh, of components in the essential oils. There's a lot of them are dominated by one, but they have a long list. And you know the interesting thing is how you know the same chemicals show up. Not only in other spices, but you know, um, uh, just like both cinnamon and nutmeg have essential oils that also show up in hops, which which I, I thought was kind of interesting. When I think of nutmeg, I think of uh, um, eggnog mostly. You know, when yeah. I when I smell yeah. nutmeg, that's the first thing that comes to my not mind is that is uh, that's probably the biggest spice, or maybe the only spice. I don't know. I've never made an eggnog from scratch, but that's that's what I think of. And whatever you do, don't go to YouTube and search for the nutmeg challenge. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, nut, uh, I have heard some things about nutmeg, but I don't know. I don't know what the nutmeg challenge is. Do you eat it, or what? Do you other th- do other things with it? Uh, teenagers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they'll snort large amounts of it because it's a hallucinogen. So. Oh, nice. Don't yeah. Don't try that at home. Don't try that at home. Especially after you brew it into your beer. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now it comes in this uh, in this big nut, and it's a fairly big nut. Yeah. Uh, and you you grate it. Uh, mm-hmm. I would assume you wouldn't want to pull a put it put a put a whole nut in your uh, in your beer. Uh, you probably want to grate that as opposed to put it, slow down as. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be okay in putting a whole. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know how you brew your beer. <laughs> you could put. You could put a whole cinnamon stick in your in your brew, but you wouldn't want to put a whole nutmeg nut in your beer, probably. So you want to grate that, probably. Yeah, um, whole nutmeg comes. Uh, yeah, it's a fairly good sized seed, and, and you can grate it. Uh, it also comes, obviously, as as a powder. Um, but again, uh, you, 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 for optimum freshness, you want to get uh, uh, the whole form, probably. Yeah, if you could, that would be that would be it, you know just a general uh, approach. Although you, I mean, you can, especially if you if you go to you know some of the bigger supermarkets these days with sort of better, more you know foodie oriented uh, places ha- have reasonably decent spice you know uh, sections, and you can get if you get uh, the spice and it's fresh. Like I know at. Um, in Austin, there's a couple supermarkets where you go and, they, and the spices are out, and you can, you know, you take a little teaspoon and put them, you know, fill how much you want in a bag, and so you can just you can smell them, and you can tell like if you open the little bin uh, and, and smell it, even if it's ground, if it smells good and fresh, then you know it should be workable. I, you know, I wouldn't want to say I wouldn't want to make a blanket statement like never use ground spices in a beer because that's Mm-hmm. You know, too limiting, and also for a lot of people, depending on where you live, you know, you might not have access to a you know a hoity-toity spice shop, and you know, uh, basically let your let your nose and your and your senses guide guide you to picking spices that are, you know, that are, are fresh and usable, and you know, even if you're if you're brewing something and you're you know digging through your spice cabinet, you know, a take a look to see if there's a date on it, and b just Pour some out and you know smell it. If it if it still smells like it's fresh and it's good, uh, then use it. If it if it's you know lost most of its character, then go get new spices because you're you know you could add more to try to make up for that. But then you get more of that just sort of plant you know uh, tannins and and you know things you don't want from the spice into your beer. That's a good point about the. Uh, there's a natural food store in uh, Fayetteville. Uh, that where you can go and they have the bulk spices and, you know, you can buy just what you need. You can buy just a little bit of the spice yeah. and weigh it out. And that way you don't have to ha- buy like a whole bottle that may be A, uh, more than you would use in, say, a year or yeah. or B, more expensive than you'd want to pay. As long as that grocery store has enough traffic to where their big jar of spice turns over <laughs> in a reasonable amount of time. You're you're in yeah. good shape there. Spice number three on the list. Spice number three, cloves. Okay, cloves are from a uh, plant called uh, Zizigium aromaticum. This is another one that's grown in Indonesia. Uh, it cloves is, you know, a lot of people probably know it from pumpkin pie spice, but mm-hmm. it also shows up in a lot of like African cooking, um, Asian cooking, Middle Eastern cooking, uh, cloves are, you know, it's a very rec- recognizable, uh, uh, aroma and flavor. Uh, cloves are actually flower buds from the plant and the, uh, primary essential oil found in them, uh, between like three quarters and maybe up to 90% in different cloves is eugenol, which is, you know, uh, uh, one of the one of the components, one of the minor components of uh, cinnamon, but in, in cloves, it's the major component. Uh, some of the minor components are beta caryophylline. Okay, uh, that that's a component of hops. Vanillin, uh, as, as you might guess, that's uh, the major component of vanilla. Although in cloves, it's not. You know, it's a minor component. Uh, gallotanic acid. Okay, for people interested in winemaking. Uh, some of the, some of the ta- tannins in wine are gallotannins, and um, methyl salicylate is another component of cloves. That's sometimes called the oil of wintergreen, and it's if you've ever used Bengay or Listerine, it's a component of that. It's it's got uh, pain killing applications. So hmm. cloves have a wide variety of 
like all these spices have a long list of uh, essential oils and other ingredients. And as with the other ones, they, they overlap partially with uh, some of the oils and hops and, you know, some of the essential oils in, in other spices. Hmm. And again, you can find whole cloves and you can find them ground as well. Yeah. Whole cloves are easy to find. That's probably of, uh, you know, if you go to a, a spice store and it's not so good or, or supermarket, you're still almost always going to be able to find whole cloves. That's You, you see them sticking in uh, uh, citrus fruit a lot of times. Or, or Don't they stick them in hams and such? Or yeah. Glazed hams and such? Or yeah. At least in 70s cookbooks they used to. Uh, <laughs> um and then uh, and then spice number 4 spice number 4 uh allspice and allspice is a uh, I guess a spice used in a uh, Caribbean cooking a lot and it's it's called allspice because it some people claim that it tastes like cinnamon nutmeg and cloves all rolled into one mm. so after choosing those first three this was kind of the the obvious fourth one to uh to uh look at and this is a uh, allspice comes from a plant called uh, pimento dioecia and this is grown in, in mexico and central america and allspice is the dried berries from the uh okay the the plant produces a fruit and these berries are picked uh sort of interestingly enough before they're ripe then they're dried in, into the little uh you know some people call them allspice seeds but they're really the entire fruit is dried um, and interestingly enough, the, the fresh leaves of the plant can be used as allspice too. But once you once they're dried, they they lose uh, their, their spiciness, and so they're not like the you don't ever see like dried you know allspice leaves uh, being sold. And I mean, I, I've actually never even seen fresh allspice leaves being sold. I think that might be something that's probably used like right where they're grown, but not really that much. And anyway, so given that. Allspice supposedly tastes like these other things, as, as you might expect. That they, they, it shares an overlapping, yeah, uh, set of uh, essential oils, and and the biggest one in allspice is is the same one as the biggest one in cloves. It's eugenol. So, um, basically, yeah, there's there's those four spices. The, they're very commonly used in uh, winter warmers, and. Uh, I mean, I just, I just thought it would be interesting to look at where they come from. You know, I know as, uh, as brewers, you know, we know where, what hops are, we know what barley is, what part of the plants they come from. But, you know, for me, like a lot of the spices, um, I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew where cinnamon came from, but to me, a lot of spices are just, you know, it comes from a spice rack. I don't, you know, I don't know how they grow it. <laughs> and, uh, so I just thought it'd be interesting to do, do an article on that on, Beer and wine journal about where where these spices come from. <laughs> now, which which cat is that? Pandora. Thanks, Pandora. <laughs> so, how do you use these things? For most spices, there there's one of two ways that people do it. I mean, I I suppose there's more, but the most common is to either add the spice at the end of the boil, or to make an extract with it with alcohol. Um, if you add it at the end of the boil, uh you know, it, it, this works very good for, for a lot of spices because you boil it just long enough to drive off the essential oils, you know, which are generally, you know, uh, aromatic and, and they're, you know, they easily uh, easily evaporate from uh, the spice or whatever. But you don't boil the plant parts for a long time so that you get a, a vegetal or a tannic, you know, uh, bite from them. So end of the boil – is great in most cases. Uh, if you look at various recipes, it it varies. Some people throw it in at knockout. Some people throw it in a couple minutes earlier. Uh, that's the sort of thing. I I would err on the side of adding it later, just because boiling it longer is, is your you're liable to. In my mind, you're liable to just boil away the the flavors, you know, and, and aromas. Mm -hmm. um, and the the interesting thing I think about uh, making spice beers is trying to find the right amount of spice to add. I mean, if you read, you know, online forums, people are, how much should I add of this? How much should I add of that? And and you read all these, you know, stories of, oh, I, I added the, as much as the guy's, you know, recipe said, and it came out way overspiced, or I couldn't taste the spice. 
And I mean, I think one thing that people really need to, uh, you know, brewers really need to understand is that the strength of the spices and the strength and freshness of the spice really matters. It's like when we add hops, which are a spice, to, to beer, you know, we've got the alpha acid rating and we take that into consideration so that we don't add too much or little. Um, with spices, you know, they don't have, uh, I mean, some spices do, but but you generally don't buy them with a with a, a rating on them to know how uh, how much to use. And so, you know, you've got to, you've got to come up with a way to find out the right amount to add to the beer. And, you know, for a lot of people also, it's a lot of homebrewers, it's a one shot deal. You don't, you know, if you were a commercial brewery, you could brew one batch, taste it, make the adjustment, you know, refine and, you know, work on it. But for most people, you're going to brew a batch of, uh, of holiday beer, you know, or, or spiced beer and then move on. So you've got to sort of, you got to figure out how to, how to, um, you know, judge the amount of spice. And for me, there, there'd be a couple ways. I, you know, when I make a spice beer, I like to look around and see how much other recipes call for. And then, you know, I, I try to get, when I, when I brew a, a spice beer, I try to go get fresh spices for it unless I know I have something in my cupboard that's, you know, really fresh. And so when I do that, I, I, I'd look at the lower end of the, the amounts that the people have added in other recipes. Uh, Cause for one thing, I figure um, if you make a spice beer and it's not spicy enough, that's far better than brewing one and having it just be like this, this undrinkable spice bomb. Mm-hmm. So I, I tend to tend to shoot low because you can also, you can also make an extract of alcohol. You know, you stick a, stick the spices in a little in a little glass jar fill it with uh like vodka or everclear or or you know some sort of neutral spirit let it sit for a little while and then you can use that to to, to spike a batch of beer if, you know if it's in a keg um and, and bring up bring up the spicing amount but you can't the, the only way to bring down the spicing amount in a beer is to brew the base beer again and and blend it into and most people you know, to rescue a batch, most people aren't are willing to, to brew this, the same thing over again. Um, yeah, this so. uh, uh, Douglas Rosinski on the show uh, with his uh, Carolina Reaper beer, <clears throat> he used that tincture method, you know, soaking the peppers uh, in the uh, neutral uh, spirit uh, and then, uh, you know, sampling with a, just a glass of beer. Uh, to get the uh, amount right, and then that way he was able to, you know, flavor a larger batch uh, of beer, you know, at bottling time, essentially. Um, so it seems like if you're if you're nervous or if you if you don't know a lot about how much spice to add, or if you can't find a recipe that you trust, um, using the tincture method, you know, using the uh, soaking the spices in the neutral spirit, and then and then adding proportionally, uh, say at bottling time, it seems like to me the safest. Uh, way to go yeah you uh you essentially if you're going to do that alcohol method uh and making a tincture you can can make a test blend which then helps immensely in uh producing you know uh results that you want let's talk about base beers uh which styles of beer or which uh uh base beers and what hopping strategy uh are we going to think of to pair these spices with well, you can – hypothetically, you can spice almost any style of beer. But in practice, uh, the you know the scope of beers that the people do actually add spices to is uh, a lot narrower. Uh, one of the most popular, like uh, – especially if you're talking about, uh, you know, winter holiday beers, Christmas beers, et cetera. Uh, these – a lot of these tend to be dark beers, you know, like the, there's, you know, Anchors series of beers – Every year, uh, you know, dark beers with, with a roasty character and, you know, some some blend of spices, you know, certainly like most cinnamon beers I've ever had have been either either the dark, uh, you know, dark roasty beer or I have had, uh, you know, like a cinnamon beers where they've been blended into a uh, uh, like a red ale, type, you know, amber ale type background. And we, if you want some ideas uh, on uh, how to 
brew a spicy beer, you can go to beerandwinejournal.com and search for fruitcake. You can get my uh, infamous uh, fruitcake barley wine uh, recipe in there. And Tom from New Jersey uh, sent a an example of his uh, uh, version of our fruitcake uh, barley wine uh, a little while ago. And uh, Steve and Andy sampled that uh Paired with or, or up against uh, a two-year-old version of my fruitcake barley wine, the last time I brewed it, and it was interesting to see his his uh, spices were, you know, a whole lot fresher uh, tasting and and kind of upfront uh, than mine were. You know, mine had mellowed over those two years, uh, so that was an interesting. I'm sure that you know it wasn't the exact recipe side by side, but it was interesting to see how. Uh, you know, an interesting example of how uh, spices can evolve over time. Uh, so check that recipe out. Uh, if you are, it is a very spicy beer. I mean, it's it's kind of a spice bomb. So if you're, uh, if you are kind of shy about brewing it, uh, brew a small batch first and, you know, do half of the spices and see, you know, what you, what you think about them. Uh, but a lot of people like it. A lot of people brew it and it's got a lot of fruit in it. Um, and molasses and and the brown sugar and such as that, and you've got a recipe on there for uh, called cranberry zinger, uh, which doesn't necessarily have spices in it, but it's got another um, holiday favorite, and that's cranberries. Yeah, this is uh my uh, Thanksgiving beer because I, I go nuts every year around Thanksgiving because it's my, my favorite holiday. And one thing I've many years I've made is this. This beer, which I which I just call cranberry zing or, or whatever, and it's uh, basically you brew like sort of an American wheat beer with a little bit of honey in it, you know, like a basically a blank background beer. Um, and to it, I add uh, the ingredients in cranberry relish, which are cranberries, of course, um, Granny Smith apples. Okay, the whole apple just uh, take cut the core out, but. The rest of the apple is used, and oranges, which are the whole oranges used, like the uh, the you know the white pith, the uh, zest, and the and the pulp. You know the the entire orange is, is used, and you know I take take the uh, take those three uh, fruits in the in the proportion that they're used in in cranberry relish. Uh, throw them in the uh, food processor, uh, pulverize them down to sort of you know, basically it's make cranberry relish with, with the exception of, I don't add the, the extra sugar that people do because, uh, that's not needed. And, um, I let that, I'll put that in a steeping bag and let that sit in contact with the, with the base beer for about a week and, um, and keg it. And I like to, to carbonate it highly. I like it to be fizzy because you get the, uh, the final beer is fairly dry the way I brew it. Uh, you've got, the the cranberries add both tartness and a little bit of uh, sort of uh, puckering mouthfeel to them, like a little bit like tannins. Um, and, and I think it actually is tannins, uh, but it, it's that that same sort of uh, mouthfeel. And uh, it's it's every time I've, I've I've brought it to to a Thanksgiving gathering, like people have really liked it. It's uh, it, it's almost. Uh, it almost tastes more like like uh, like a sparkling champagne than a beer, really, because the the cranberries in the amount I add re- like really sort of just ate the whole thing. Uh, but it's uh, you know I like it, and even even as a guy who like my my general taste in beer runs towards you know just you know barley, hops, water, and yeast. Most that's most of what I brew and most of what I like. I do like this one uh, beer just because it's different. And it's uh, it's it's like a nice contrast too at uh, Thanksgiving when you have you know Thanksgiving is loaded with you know savory dishes essentially you know it's nice to have something that's that's tart and and uh, uh, effervescent and uh, you know uh, it's it's also one of the one of the recipes that like other people have brewed quite a bit of mine and everyone all the feedback I've ever got from people is that they loved it because it's one thing it's virtually foolproof cranberries are so strongly flavored that if you add them you know in the amounts that i call for it just you know uh it, it's it I, I would think it would be virtually impossible to screw the recipe up you know <laughs> 
And the uh, along with the fruit, you add an enzyme as well. Yeah, I do. Uh, you don't have to, but I add a pectic enzyme, which uh, just helps with clarity. Um, Makes you, sense. You don't absolutely need to, but it's. I think it 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 looks nicer when it uh, when it's clear because the uh, and it's highly carbonated, so it it you know kicks up a nice foam stand, which is you know sort of pinkish red. And if the if the base beer looks, uh, you know, nice and clear, I, I just think it, presentation wise, I think it looks pretty good. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I think that I think the tannins in the uh, uh, and related compounds in the uh, cranberries also help it become clear. So you know, if you just if you get rid of the the you know uh, the things that the pectic enzyme gets rid of, the rest of the beer sort of takes care of itself. It makes a it makes a every time I've brewed it that way it's been just crystal clear you know it cleared up very quickly and um yeah it's just it it's uh it's a, it's a beer I really like it's one thing it's super simple like brewing the brewing the American wheat base is, is you know real easy a lot of times I just I a lot of times I go just straight with uh malt extract you know I don't even bother to do a uh, partial mash or anything because you know the uh yeah, the the beer characteristics are really gonna you know honestly gonna be covered up almost a hundred percent. So I just don't worry, you know. Just get get fresh extract and, and you know I pay attention to the brewing and do it well, but I, I don't worry about having you know the 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 base beer itself doesn't have to be a knockout uh, mm-hmm. to work. And then um, yeah, it's it's easy. It's it's quick too. Once it uh, you know because the base beer isn't that strong, and uh, it really only takes like a week. Of, of contact with the fruit and then I, you know, I just keg it and carbonate it and I, I've never had to like wait to let it condition, you know, by, I usually, my carbonation method is just to crank the uh, CO2 pressure up to like 30 PSI or something and let it sit for three days and, uh, you know, then dial it back down to, to whatever serving pressure I want. Uh, and every time, you know, every time I pour the first glass, you know, it's been fine or at least the second glass, the first glass usually had, there's some gunk that settled down to the bottom of the, <laughs> the keg, but the, the second glass pours out fine. So it's, you know, and again, I think it's, I think the, the cranberries, they had that tartness and, and the, the pH drops. And I think it just, everything that needs to happen conditioning wise just happens very quickly in that beer. Hmm. So that's a, that's something that you could do maybe for Christmas. Yeah. Oh, easily. Cool. So go to your homebrew store this weekend and get those ingredients and and uh, brew that one up, and uh, look for the, all the ingredients that should be in the uh, the grocery stores around this time. Yeah, uh, go to the grocery store the day after Thanksgiving and <laughs> pick up. Some- Seriously, there's probably going to be a sale on cranberries. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, I uh, I hope that uh, I hope that you have an awesome Thanksgiving. And uh, we, we'll probably talk to you before Christmas or the, before the end of the year. But uh, sure, happy holidays, Chris Colby. Why, thank you, James. Happy, uh, happy holidays to you, too. <laughs> Thanks again to Chris. Go to beerandwinejournal.com this week to check out those stories. And once again, congratulations to Chris on the book deal. I can't wait to see how it turns out. And with just a reminder... Uh, Next week being Thanksgiving, we're going to take the week off for Thanksgiving. So don't panic. Uh, If we're not there, uh, we're we're eating too much with family and friends, and I hope that uh, you are doing the same as well. Don't forget to send in your brewing disaster stories for this year's disaster show. Uh, You can send them to, along with brewing questions, show suggestions, or, you know, if you just want to say howdy, send it all to james at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site uh, at a new reduced pricing. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo check out our shirts in the store as well 
You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on BasicBrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at BasicBrewingShop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, especially during this busy holiday season. We greatly appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Uncle Les's Tea, Organic White Tea, Premium Organic White Tea in Bags, 100 Count, and Innova Fitness Heavy Duty Deluxe Inversion Therapy Table. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Home Brewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is brought by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.